infrastructure is crumbling and the problems are only getting worse. The pressure to find solutions is hot. Let's talk about why American cities have no water, no electricity, and no money to fix their infrastructure problems. Welcome to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast, hosted by Chad Smelter. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast. My name is Chad Smelter. I am your host. Today, today's guest is Dan Kaup with the City of Wheeling, Illinois. He's the Public Works Director. Thank you for joining me, Dan. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. It's my pleasure, and thanks for asking me to be on the show. Excited to have you, Dan. I've heard a lot of good things about you. You're progressive. You have a lot of experience in the industry, uh, over 13 years from what I could count, which is a lot. And then um, the first thing we do in this podcast is learn more about how you got into the industry and why did you want to be in public works? Yeah, I, I think that there are a few people in this world who would say that they um, started out in you know fifth grade wanting to get into a career in public works, and I don't think I'm any different. Um, I went to uh, to college uh, for arts and sciences. I got a, a degree in history and political science, and while I was in school, I had uh, started uh, as a seasonal for the public works department in Northbrook, and um, I enjoyed it enough that when I graduated um, from college, I decided to apply for a full-time position as a maintenance worker, um, not knowing exactly what I wanted to do. I had taken the LSAT, I took the GRE, and um, just wanted a paycheck, and uh, it was fun. And so for the next five years, I was a maintenance worker working for the streets division and uh, doing concrete and asphalt and snow plowing in the winter. Um, I really enjoyed all of it. Um, I subsequently got my master's degree in public administration and um, was uh, then considered for the position of assistant to the village manager in Northbrook. Um, and I was in that position for five years after that. So uh, 2002, 07, 07 to 12. And during that time, I got a, a, a period, a, a, a look at what the administration side of, uh, of the public administration really is and how uh, municipalities work and how the governance process happens. And, um, it, uh, um, it was something that I really enjoyed, but I also did miss uh, public works. And so in 2012, I applied for and um, was hired to be the public works director for the village of Brookfield. And um, yeah, so yeah, at uh, 32 years old, I was a public works director and I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, interesting. I, um, pardon? I said, interesting. No, I was just going to uh, kind of go back to what you were saying and, and talk about you know, what's curious on my end is understanding where you are a maintenance worker and then you got, you decided to get that degree, right? And then go through school. What was the deciding factor there that you were just like, I want to move up. I want to advance. Cause you said at the beginning it's, you were money driven, right? I mean, that's kind of the way I got into workforce is like money, but you know, just curious on, on that process for you. Sure. I, I, and, and I was partially, it was like, Oh, look at what the superintendents make here. They're, you know, yeah, yeah. You're rolling in it, and uh, <laughs> um, but but I um uh, I I wanted to do as much as I could, and I and at the time I loved the actual work. I loved working with my hands. I loved um, uh, finishing concrete. I, I loved being on the ground finishing concrete. I loved um, paving asphalt. Um, but yeah, I, I was like, you know, I could I could uh, I could be a supervisor. I could be a superintendent. Um, and it never crossed my mind that I, you know, I would be much, uh, uh, that's what, that's what my goal was. Yeah. Um, having an exposure to the, uh, the administrative side of things after I went back for my, my MPA, um, completely, uh, you know, blew all that apart. And, um, I really started to enjoy the fiduciary responsibility of managing, um, assets and infrastructure from the perspective of, hey, we're, we're playing with other people's money. And um, it's important that we contemplate how our decisions impact people's tax rates and um, their enjoyment of the community in which they live. And um, it, that that different perspective offered through uh, having a better understanding of, of management really uh, changed my understanding of what I wanted to do still in municipal government, but uh, from a different uh, vantage point. Yeah, that that is awesome. I mean, look, it, you gotta have even in 
you know, business and government, I mean, you to move up, you you have to want to move up. You have to get yourself educated to want to learn more about what you're going to move into, right? If you want to be a public works director, you have to meet this criteria, right? I mean, that's what you have to do. And you got to get that education to do that. And you took the steps and needs you needed to do that. And that's impressive because you don't see a lot of that happening. More and more it's happening. But, you know, if you stay a maintenance worker, it's almost like, you know, we it's 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 something that everybody just doesn't want to do. You know, I climb trees, for example. I didn't want to climb trees after a year and a half of getting out of high school. I was like, I'm not doing that stuff. I'm climbing trees. This is the riskiest job ever. I was like, I got to figure out a new way to move up. I got to do yeah. a senior technician. You know, I became a pest control manager, you know, ran around and did service work. So those are the little things I learned to just move myself up and uh, didn't get the education that, that you have. But uh, definitely one of those things you, you, you do in life. You know, I, I hope everybody does. That kind of thing. Uh, absolutely, yeah. It's uh, it was an opportunity as well. I didn't necessarily um, fit the mold for um, moving into the manager's office, um, but uh, you know, with everything, you're at the right place at the right time and speaking to the right people and um, opportunities. Yeah, um, are there uh, if you're looking? Yeah, the assistant uh, village manager position had to be uh, eye opening. I would imagine, you know, more. Politi like not going into all the politics of it, but just, you know, it, it had to be, you had to learn a lot about the inner workings of government, I would assume. No, absolutely. And, and that's something that, um, well, I think that the field perspective is uh, of monumental importance and it certainly has helped me um, in my um, role as public works director for a number of communities. Um, also having an understanding of the politics and well, you know, it's not necessarily a direct responsibility of somebody in the public works department. It's something that you have to be keenly aware of because um, you're dealing with um, other agencies. Public works deals with the park district, library district, school districts all the time, uh, the county uh, government, uh, uh, state agencies, the IEPA and the you know, Department of Transportation. And um, you have to understand the impact of the manner in which you interact with all of these agencies, um, coupled with the fact that you're consistently interacting with the politicians, the locally elected um, board or council members, um, and be aware of um, their needs and their expectations. And um, it, it, it is an important part of the job that I, I definitely benefited uh, in my role as the assistant to the village manager in, in Northbrook being exposed to certain things that I don't think otherwise uh, I would have been if I just did public works. Yeah, no, I, a hundred percent. I, that's, that's, uh, again, it's just another stepping stone to learn more and learn more, you know, your, your growth mindset, I can tell already. That's right. The biggest thing is just like learning and, and, and grabbing on to more things and your, your, uh, you know, you and I talked prior to this and you know, asset management has become like a, a thing for you, right? It's like one of those things you, you, you enjoy, you kind of mentioned it. And can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Absolutely. I, I, and, you know, it's become a, a catchword in the uh, public works profession, probably over the last 10 years um, and, and, and maybe in the last five really heavily. Uh, but it's something that I was exposed to uh, in depth while I was the deputy public works director in uh, Lake in the Hills, working under a gentleman by the name of Fred Millard, who was a lifelong um, uh, Air Force uh, major who managed um, air bases. And he, he did a very bureaucratic but uh, and, and federally minded um, asset management using um, software systems that were developed in the 70s and 80s just for the, the military. Way be way before what um, we now see or understand as asset management in the public works field um, uh, was around, and he drilled at home the importance of understanding through having your uh, condition assessments um, tied to your um, asset inventory, your life cycle cost analysis, your replacement um, budgeting, your um, uh, understanding of how you interface with uh, maintenance and operations procedures with all of your infrastructure and then putting that together in a plan so that you can definitively say, you know, this is what I should be spending every year in order to make sure that um, our community members are getting the most um, out of their money. Yeah. And, and from that, yeah, I, I, um, um, I, I, I grew into an interest that I didn't otherwise understand. 
um, I, I feel like my approach to public works before that was more catch as catch can. If something's broken, then you fix it. Um, and, and rather than spending the majority of your time um, doing the inspections and, and consistently making sure that everything is as it should be. Yeah. No, that's it's great. I, it's hard to find directors that are in that, you know, enthusiastic about like learning more about like a hydrant, you know, simple stuff, you know, a hydrant. Well, when's it need replaced? How much maintenance have we done on it? You know, all that adds up. It's all data. You start talking about data. And that is that is stuff we as, uh, you know, in public works, we need to start focusing on organizing that data. Right. And and how to prioritize it then. Yeah, uh, data is, um, that is the, the premise of, uh, the interaction of data is the premise of, of um, how asset management can work for you. And I think that um, a lot of times for communities or um, department leaders that haven't um, um, had experience with asset management, it's a scary concept. It's definitely broad. And uh, depending on how deep you drill into it, it can be very deep. So it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot. And um, I think what we have as a responsibility as, as uh, public works managers and, and asset managers is um, a responsibility to try to uh, demystify the subject and make it more approachable, make it easier to understand and to offer um, tools and resources to communities who are looking to implement asset management but don't necessarily have the wherewithal or the, the um, in-house knowledge base to do so. Yeah, because, you know, now... Uh, I have familiarity with data and just, you know, my last startup we had, we did a lot of data curation, just pivot tables and things like that, where we prioritize assets. And that was one of our uh, go-tos for helping project, prioritize capital projects, right? So where do you think, because, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of live events and conversations with a bunch of other directors and things that uh, uh, adoption of technologies has been a a, a big hurdle for public works departments and you you've been pioneering it in your end, but how do other municipalities start to get over that, that hill and, and really start embracing tech? Sure. I, th there are a ton of um, built in um, obstacles to um, public um, entities investing in technology that may not be um, fully proven or, you know, used broadly. And um, that could very well be um, a missed opportunity. I, I think that um, as um, as those who are responsible for trying to to find more efficient ways or more effective ways of carrying out our responsibilities, it's incumbent on us to to keep an ear to the rail to learn about what is uh, coming down the pike or to learn about what new technologies are available and out there. Um, and so I, I think one of the best ways to do that is to have some sort of technology or innovation um, um, focus, uh, whether it be a team member who has a natural uh, penchant for um, uh, reading about it or following trends. Um, to uh, for me, and that's definitely not me. I, uh, while I while I do um, try to be progressive in, in implementing ideas that that will improve. The village of Wheeling and, and its a, a asset infrastructure um, system. I I rely on networks, so I have uh, close friends who are you know within my cohort and directors in other communities who are more uh, tech savvy than I am. Who let me know about programs and and um, uh, software and opportunities and companies that are you know kind of leading the way, and I engage and and I try to to. Uh, um, see how it fits into our business model, see how um, we could Im improve what we're doing or to um, leverage what uh, products they have to, to make life easier. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great place to be right now. I think, you know, as more acceptance comes and we become more transparent and we could be more cooperative as you and I kind of alluded to earlier, um, it's 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 a very important place because as you know we were talking beforehand is infrastructure uh service companies you know they are limited on labor like you are but uh, you know if we can organize this information and you know keep it uh to where we can make it beneficial for multiple municipalities to benefit from that certain service company that's working in a general area that'd be 
very beneficial to a lot of communities and price breaks and things like that. So we could definitely make a big difference uh, down the road with some of this stuff. Tech, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Tech's getting into. But um, you, uh, you've you been a pioneer for like cooperatives and, and things like that, it sounds like, and asset management. So what have you been working with some of your other uh, colleagues in the space? What have you guys been implementing? Uh, any certain types of programs? Uh, sure. Well, it, it, from an asset management perspective, um, absolutely. Uh, the, the American Public Works Association Chicago Metro chapter uh, created a, an asset management committee hmm. in uh, 2021, and uh, <clears throat> they asked me to uh, participate in that uh, endeavor as a, a chairperson to to build a committee and to um, start serving as a resource to other communities who are. Um, interested in um, in starting an asset management program or improving an asset management program. So um, right now we have um, we have a committee that um, focuses on leveraging technologies and improving um, uh, their ability to select the software if they're looking to implement the an asset management software um, to interface with the national uh, level of the APWA on um, on asset management issues, as well as to put on educational uh, uh, opportunities for the chapter. So we typically put on three or four presentations of various sorts uh, every year, and it's it's been good. We have a good cross section of communities that have uh, fully developed and uh, well ensconced um, programs, such as Buffalo Grove and Schaumburg. Uh, Wheeling, um, we, we just went live with our software program in March of this year, so we're, we're brand new. We, we've got a fledgling, um, uh, program that while it's in its infancy, uh, you know, our organization as a whole went through the, the, the pain point of, uh, implementation. And it's never fun to implement the, one of those holistic large software uh, programs. Uh, Northbrook is just coming online. They have, uh, uh, Steve uh, Fritz, he's a member of the committee. They're in the process of selecting the software. Uh, Crystal Lake is uh, represented as well. So we have, we have, uh, communities, um, uh, of various, uh, levels of experience or, or places, um, with, with the program development. We also have a couple of, um, private sector, um, representatives as well from consulting engineering firms uh, who either have uh, asset management experience directly or um, GIS and mapping uh, geospatial experience and uh, which is obviously integral to uh, asset management as yeah. we know it today. So um, yeah, education is important. That's, that's really what we've been focusing on recently. Yeah, you mentioned implementation and I've talked to some sewer operators uh, in this space and uh, one thing that I thought was interesting when I had a conversation with them is they said technology is making things more difficult. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting. And I, you know, I'm trying to figure out like how it's making it more difficult. And I'm, I'm not sure if you could maybe you know, give some insight to that, but I'm just you know, kind of throwing it out there yeah. uh, as have you experienced that too? Like where they just think it's, you know, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, uh, it, um, from the, the 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 workers' perspective, from a maintenance workers' perspective, um, you know they're they're used to doing something a certain way for the last sixty years, um, and now you hand them a tablet and you say go out and now what I want you to do is you have to interface with this um, piece of electronic equipment every time you touch a tool, every time you um, fix a, a sign or a, a, a take off a tree limb or um, repair a trip hazard or whatever. And they, it's not that they don't understand. They're like, this is extra work. What do you want me to do? Do you want me to go out there and fix the thing? Or do you want me to sit here and monkey with the data all day? And it's like, well, we want you to do both. Um, because, because now data is really more of a, a driver of what we do. It wasn't. And I understand that. Yeah. And I can speak, you know, public works was not the public works 20 years ago. I came into the field in 2002 and, um, it, it's, it's a different, you know, the trucks look the same and the tools look similar, but it is not because not we are looking to make data driven decisions. Um, they, they say, um, uh, you know, it takes me more time. 
to to play with the with the tablet than it does for me to do the work. Okay, yeah, we have to improve on that, and um, I, that is that's hard. Yeah. Um, why do you want me to track all this? Are you trying to get rid of my job? That that makes it hard for them because that it, it instills unless it's well communicated uh, a level of fear. Why am I? What, so are you you're trying to be more efficient? Does that mean less of me? Yeah. Um, no, no, it doesn't. In fact, if anything, we're trying to make a case for why we have the labor levels that we have. It's important that I'm able to go to the board or to my boss, to the village manager and say, we have a vested interest in keeping this these programs in house. And here's the data that shows that we are efficient or we weren't efficient. And now we are because we've implemented these improvements based on what we've learned and how we in, interact with the infrastructure. I'm telling you, man, I'm smiling because I, the, just the conversations I've had, like you've had, and, you know, we want to... <sighs> We want to have a great public works department that that is the operators are, are, are technology focused now. You know, we you, you know what? And you want to keep your job like you want to keep like that's the thing is like we want technology to help make us more efficient so that we you like you said it, you nailed it. You're like, so I can go to council and say, this is why we need more people, because customer service is going to be a more focused aspect of our business i mean it's gonna be and you need to go to, to mrs mary's house and take care of whatever the, the municipalities are going to start focusing on customer service more than anything so technology is going to have to help drive that i think and this is just me spitballing my opinions obviously but it's it's one yeah. of those things where if you want to get more people in public works you, you adopt the technology you become more efficient so you can do more things you can hire more people i mean that's seems to where it should be going. And, you know, that seems like you're on the same path there with that. And, uh, you know, that's, that's one thing is we were talking about on this live event a couple months or a couple, actually yesterday, I forget the days now, but anyway, uh, it was, we were talking about the future of public works should be brand like branded as technology driven, not like the, this is the way we did it 60 years ago. You know, that's, it's got to change to like, we're using tablets now we're data driven, we're public works, you know? So anyway, that's Absolutely. my, my little rant. <laughs> so. it's, not, it's it's a rant. It's not a rant. It is the song that you're singing, and uh, I I am right there with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, well, we're not going to solve all those problems today on the podcast, but uh, you know, one of those things that I think we all need to start talking about. You're right on the money with that. You got to have data so you can go to council. You can visually display what's going on because everyone's got to see it uh, because of hearing it. If it's out of sight, it's out of mind. You know, that's the way the the things are moving. So we can get technology into this asset management and move it to where you can show council why you need the funding or why you need the labor force that you need. And it'll help justify your stance on, on what you believe as a public works director. How are you dealing with the labor shortages though, as everyone else is? I mean, is there, I, I don't know. I'm have you not, been struggling I'm, with it? There's a lot of wood. No, I don't, I have, um, we are fully staffed as a department in house. And I think the, the, the place that we've seen um, more of a challenge is in the, the contractual side. Mm. Um, costs are going up because uh, contractors can be more picky on what they do because there's more work than they can swing a shovel at. And yeah. So um, they're getting uh, fewer uh, bids and higher bids. And um, it's not sustainable. Uh, yeah. No, it's not. It's not. Well, it, no, it's not sustainable because the because it's just a, it's a vicious tornadic cyclone uh, upward spin it just keeps on going and going and it, and it feeds itself it's self-perpetuating we have to raise uh more revenue in order to be able to pay for the same amount of work that costs 25 percent more and if it's every year then you know something's gonna give yeah yeah, something's definitely got to gotta happen or we need more money from somewhere to help fund these projects because you got to keep the projects going, but you can't charge a homeowner a 50% bump on their rates. That's going to be a problem for everybody. Oh, so, absolutely. Yeah, this is, should be interesting to see how this all, all plays out. But it, as far as asset management goes and, you know, public works, what are what are some of your future, um, you know, visions of what you, and, you can see and, and how you want to do things? Uh, in the future, I think that um, we're going to see a lot more uh, shared services or at least um, consideration of um, getting together with uh, other municipalities to understand how they do uh, what they do. 
there are very few, there, there are fewer and fewer communities that operate in a vacuum. And um, it's by um, necessity that they have to become part of the uh, think tank. And yeah. um, I think if you look back 15 or 20 years, there were a lot of communities where, you know, there was no interaction. And more and more, um, I see the, uh, the other directors coming to um, have just yesterday, we had a director's lunch. There was, you know, eight of us sitting at a table and talking about um, what's happening, understanding who um, is worth giving a call from a contractor's perspective, who you might want to pass over. And I think that um, as we move uh, down the road, we're going to want to have some sort of tool or service where we're able to interface with um, each other through, uh, you know, through a, a single point where we can say, you know, this is what's going on. Yeah. Um, Communication is going to be key for sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but no, that was it. That was it. That's where I think we're going. Is, yeah, is, yeah. Yeah. I think communication is going to have to be improved. You know, I, you know, siloing data, which we've habitually have done in, in procurement and in local governments has restricted our ability to like, get better pricing, better communication among public agencies, you know, that kind of stuff. Cause we're all, well, this is our silo and our finance department. We kind of run everything and nothing gets communicated. Like what contracts we have between each other, or if a contractor does a bad job and then it comes to your bid and then they bid on yours and then you award it. And then you didn't know they did a bad job. Just imagine that, you know, all that that continues to, to happen. Um, get some, you know, I don't like to say bad apples, but bad apples become bad apples and they continue to get bigger sometimes if if you don't know where they're you know not giving you the good workmanship and stuff like that for example absolutely and i just uh beyond you know looking at, at um, um who's out there that we interface with from a, a consulting uh perspective or a contracting perspective just having an understanding of of how others do it um helps me number one benchmark my services to say am i doing um, as well as I can be, and I'm going to compare myself to communities A, B, and C. Uh, but then also just to, to help solve the problems that we all face, just, you know, you, you can't know everything. You don't know everything. But collectively, we do. Collectively, um, somebody has the answer. And as long as your network is, is large enough, you'll find somebody that will be able to help you get to where you need to be. Yeah, yeah, you're 100% right. And consolidation, cooperation, all those things uh, working together in unison is going to be break down the silos, man. There's no reason for us to continue in that in that uh, traditional world. <laughs> you know, you're right on the money with uh, what you've said. Um, so if um, you could give anyone a recommend, like getting in the public works, right? We're, we're looking for people and, and, and moving up in public works. Uh, what kind of recommendation would you tell a young professional now coming into the industry? Uh, coming into the industry, I would say that um, the um, APWA is is the um, the one stop shop to start and develop relationships because at the end of the day, the relationships are what is key, and not just within your organization. Um, the uh, the desire to continue to progress through your um, your profession requires uh, continuing education and a desire to learn. Um, which, uh, for which there are resources in the, uh, the APWA, both for scholarships and for um, technical training courses. But most importantly, you're meeting the people who do what you do. And um, a lot of them have been doing it for longer. And they're the ones who are going to be able to help you navigate the challenges that ultimately come up for all of us uh, on, on the daily. Um, they'll help you um, be prepared to uh, uh, get ready for that interview or that, you know, taking that next step that will give you the resources that um, will help you better understand your responsibilities or understand the responsibility for the position for which you'd like to apply in the future. Um, and uh, just beyond that, they're they're there to um, uh, serve as a resource and um, it's fun at the same time. You always have a, an opportunity to go to a Cubs game or uh, whatever other social event they have going on. So that would yeah. be my advice. Yeah, you're right, man. APWA is a great resource for everyone to join and, and 
one thing uh, I need to do <laughs> on my side too. We talked about that before, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna work on that for sure. Um, but yeah, no, this is good information, Dan. I truly appreciate it. I, you know, the goal is to educate young professionals, try and give them insights of like your job every day, how you got in the industry, and 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 what you do um, in, in a day to day world of, of public work. So this information that you're sharing is very helpful. So I truly appreciate it. How can people get a hold of you? What's the best uh, way to connect? Um, yeah, give me a call. Uh, my uh, my number's on the Wheeling website. I'm, I'd be happy to um, to uh, serve as a resource in any way uh, that I could. Um, I'm, I'm also right now I'm I'm active with the Fox Valley branch of the APWA, and I I'm working as um, the president, the current president. Um, but um, I'm um, yeah I'm happy to talk. My email is uh, also on the website um, uh, at uh, wheelingil.gov. So okay, awesome man. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And our time went fast; <laughs> it's already over. So uh, thirty minutes, and uh, we'll uh, we'll chat some more. So thank you so much for joining me on the podcast, and uh, hope you have a great day. It was my pleasure, Chad. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Infrastructure Hot Seat Podcast. We hope that this show brought you some insight on relevant topics within the infrastructure world. Please join us every two weeks on Tuesday for the next episode. If you're interested in being a guest on this podcast, please set up a 15-minute interview with your host at calendly.com slash chadsmeltzer. 